people live on continental uh, land masses. They are far from the knowledge of the ocean, and so they are not aware that the real key to this balance is not on the land, but rather in the sea. There is no doubt that if people are part of the problem, then people must be part of the solution. Today, our world is at risk of losing the true caretakers of the planet, indigenous peoples. Often classified as impoverished, treated as invisible, forced from their land and years of cultural repression, the indigenous peoples of the planet must be heard. In any type of management of our resources, it's, we feel as indigenous peoples that it's really important that we are a part of every level of decision making. Numbering nearly 500 million and living in 75 of the world's 184 countries, indigenous peoples account for around 90% of the world's cultural diversity. I, I think that governments and, and environmental organizations are afraid of some indigenous people because they're the ones that have the schizophrenia. They are using their culture as a way to justify the exploitation. The people of the Pacific are facing their hardest battle yet, with climate change increased dramatic weather patterns, over-exploitation of resources, increased population, and unsustainable overfishing. We are at risk of seeing these nations and their cultures vanish forever. If we stand and watch these small island nations disappear, we will be watching the heedless destruction of the remaining places in the world, which hold the very key to true conservation, the highest levels of biodiversity left to man. The loss of biodiversity means that within an indigenous culture, you begin to lose the fabric of that culture because your kinolao for your gods are gone. Your stories about how plants re are related to you are lost. The Pacific Ocean is the largest single geographical feature on our planet. Covering a third of the Earth's surface, home to 25,000 islands, and a storeroom to some of the most complex ecosystems on Earth. It is central to all biodiversity for all the oceans. Life itself would not exist without it. There is no region as vast as the Pacific in the world. The Pacific is the largest region in the world. You could take every continent and drop it in the Pacific Ocean, it would vanish and never be found again. The Pacific is the largest geographical feature on Earth, and it's the ocean. For us, the ocean is our continent. We are little islands in a continent. And these little islands are very important because we have, within the Pacific, one of the highest rates of endemism in the world. We have a lot of species of plants and animals and fish and corals that are found nowhere else in the world. And these have potential for development for example, for medicine, for cures that other countries may not know about yet, and even we may not know about yet. We have a reciprocal relationship with the Kai. We have a reciprocal relationship with the Aina. It is our parent, it is our grandparent, it is the basis for our sustenance, and we have a responsibility to it, a responsibility for it, and in that, in, in demonstrating that responsibility, we demonstrate our responsibility to the future generations that are, that are on their way. We all work together as one, as, as, as a people, as an ecosystem. All of us need to, to, to take care of one another. And these are, these are the tradition and the practices that our elders have passed on to us. And it is our responsibility as today's generation to, to care for the land and in turn, the land will care for us. Marine conservation is decades behind most terrestrial reserves. Over 60% of the world's fish catch comes from the Pacific. And with less than 1% of this ocean being protected, the indigenous peoples of Hawaii created a reserve 
spanning 140,000 square kilometers. This being the first to be nominated as a World Heritage Site with indigenous cultural connections. Papahanaumokuakea represents, to date, the largest marine protected area in the world. Because it was indigenous people driven, it sends a very strong message to the rest of the world about how we as indigenous people can look and solve problems at a global scale and hopefully provide inspiration for other indigenous peoples in their own country to take a look at what's possible there. I think what we have to do is, as a Kanaka Maoli and as indigenous thinking people, we have to always consider the past. So our tutus, in effect, created large areas of management, not necessarily uh, no-take areas, but areas where fisheries were managed quite extensively. And that's why from an indigenous perspective, we need to understand that we've always had MPAs within our indigenous management structure. This is just larger scale. And the reason that it has to be larger scale is because the pressures on those resources have never been greater uh, in, in, in our own history and in the history of the world. It's now quite well understood and accepted that indigenous peoples have encoded into their traditional knowledge the understandings not only of sustainable development and sustainable management practices, but critical practices like propagation of endemic species that together make up the great uh, body of biodiversity. What this means is that if we are going to return to a time when the earth is in balance, we need to ensure that indigenous peoples with their culturally appropriate knowledge are part of the, of the management programs that are being designed now to address the serious problems we have. It's very important that we try and get some of the species that we've lost over the years because they play an important function within our ecosystem. Um, not only that, but also um, a lot of communities find certain uh, fish species as their totem. Uh, it has a traditional and a cultural link to the way they use their resources. So for marine protected areas, I mean designing marine protected areas, it's, try, it's very important to try and bring uh, species back into our marine environment. We, we know that the indigenous knowledge that we've been given from our ancestors on how to care for our biodiversity is really, really holds a lot of the secrets, really holds a lot of what science is now discovering, you know, and I think if we can really work together with science and bring Western science together with our traditional knowledge that it's really the way to go. Science is important because it helps community understand uh, the reason as to why they're doing it. It's just not something that communities you know, think on the top of their head that we want to protect our resources because it will help us uh, it will help benefit the communities, but that, you know, you're doing it for a reason because you want to conserve biodiversity, uh, because if you have a healthy environment or a healthy ecosystem around you, you can be able to also uh, have a healthy living in terms of how community want to use their resources. And for science, we are providing information on how an ecosystem uh, functions or um, why a certain species within a marine environment needs to be protected, why a particular habitat needs to be protected. The international community has tried to document the genome and document this biodiversity, where on the other hand, most traditional communities, at least in rural areas, still have a few men and women that are really the true scientists that know this vast diversity. So we need to find out what biodiversity is there and document it, but at the same time, we need to work with local communities to preserve this knowledge. People in the village know about biodiversity, they just don't have that name for it. But I think if we can link their traditional knowledge with conservation, which is more a Western concept of protecting threatened plants and animals, 
The second pillar is the sustainable use, which is much more important for the Pacific Islands because people don't want to be kept out of their entire fishing area or taken out of a national park. They want to develop strategies to use it in a sustainable manner in a modernizing world with greater populations. Scientists are discovering this great new knowledge. Oh, the best way to manage coral reefs and the marine environment in general is to close an area off and call it a no fishing area, no take marine protected area. And this revolutionary science is ancient custom in the Pacific. It's important that the governments that are considering creating marine protected areas incorporate native, native knowledge and native management into the creation. Um, it's a, because they have the cultural foundation and the history with that area. They are so, they're also intrinsically linked to the resources of that area. So if it's done in an incorrect way, you have the potential of separating the indigenous people from that resource. And that's not a good thing. Sacred reefs are an ancient concept in marine reserves for people in the Pacific. Sadly, their old practices have been abandoned. Today, scientists and local people are working together to bring this old knowledge back to life. Everywhere we're going in Fiji, we're finding sacred reefs. And there's a traditional story associated with that sacred reef. Now, the sacred reefs in the past would never be fished. So the whole concept of sacred reefs allowed the reefs to survive and to continue to produce a bountiful harvest. This was a perfect management system. This was inspirational in a sense. When the people changed their religion and they became modern and the beliefs were set aside, those sacred reefs were used as proof that you were a new religion and you could go in there and fish and you wouldn't die. And this is what they did. They went into the sacred reefs intentionally to prove their faith. Harvested fish, ate them, and they didn't die. So the sacred reefs have been violated now. They've been opened because of a change in belief system and because the government doesn't recognize them as sacred. The sacred uh, reefs haven't disappeared really. It's the concept of the sacredness of reefs and uh, mountains and hills and sacred areas that have uh, slowly disappeared. When the missionaries came, they brought a different kind of belief system. They all became Christians, and therefore we had to abandon our old system. Um, and so we've lost the respect for those areas that we considered sacred. Marine and land protected areas are referred to as tambu. In Fiji, some of these are permanent and some of these are temporary. Due to pressures of modern life, local people are adapting by merging the old practices with the new. So now with our reef resources depleted, communities have started taking it on themselves to put in place the same protected areas, but this time it's not for our traditions and our culture, but it's more for ensuring food security, to have more fish on the table. Uh, so that there's more food, and not only for the current generation, but also the future generations, uh, for them to enjoy. Pacific Island communities are taking it upon themselves to create marine managed areas largely for food security reasons. There are 217 community-based management areas in Fiji. One of these is the community of Kumbulau. Because in the past we, have, uh, we were using certain methods of uh, collecting fish for, you know, and we were killing all our marine resources. But with these tambu areas, we are very fortunate that uh, we have observed our tambu and uh, we have seen uh, a great flow of fish uh, down our areas and uh, we are quite uh, happy about it and the, be um, uh, the benefits of it are going back to the people of Kumbulau harvesting fish from uh, anywhere around the source and uh, especially uh, 
on the financial side of it, uh, that uh, we have helped the, um, the students of uh, Kumbulau in the, uh, the education. For the local people, yes, they're working, they, they're enthusiastic. The problem is poaching, of course, because as I say, we've lost respect for these kinds of things. So outsiders come in and poach, and it discourages the local people who are doing the conservation on their own marine resources. With these marine protected areas, managing it would mean uh, boats constantly going out to survey the areas, uh, survey their poachers that are coming in, ensure that uh, the fishing gears that have been restricted are no longer being used. And nowadays, even the commercial fishermen, uh, the, which are the main poachers on these protected areas, they are coming in in bigger boats and bigger engines, and they have the resources to come in quickly. Sometimes they come in at night, they get in the water, harvest what they can, and before community even paddles out to them, they're already long gone because they have these big engines. So it's difficult for local communities here in Fiji to enforce them in protected areas. or a Christian priest to come and bless the water to create a tambu area, bringing these old and new faiths together to secure their future. And it worked. Actually, uh, a day before the, uh, the Talatala came over, mm -hmm. all the, uh, the chiefs of the villages came over and we marked certain areas in our Ngolingoli area. And uh, the following day, the Tutalatala came over with us, uh, praying on the uh, on the tambu areas. The outcome of it that uh, there's no more illegal fishing. There's no more, you know, no one from either Wailebu or Wainunu came over to fish because they they were asked to be with us during that uh, very important ceremony. Since the establishment of the marine managed area, the village of Wainake have recorded over 250 names for over 600 finfish species and over 200 names for as many shellfish, corals, crabs and seaweeds. Many of them they haven't seen for over 30 years. <laughs> When this MPA was implemented, we saw a lot of fish coming. There was a spillover from the MPA because it was full of fish. Due to the spillover effect, we are now able to educate the children, pay for their school fees, and assist the students going into Suva. The success of the MPA has made this all possible. Now it has become the source of income for all the communities and we can see that there are more crabs, more fish and more lobsters. Oh, yeah, these crabs had previously disappeared, but following the implementation of the MP, most of these crabs have reappeared. Especially this crab and also this one. When we found the crabs, the only person who could identify and name all the crabs was the oldest lady in the village who saw them when she was young. The community formed the Gweti Navakavu project meaning lift up from the water. This symbolized hope and a sense of responsibility we have for our lives. Now, our future generations will be aware of the various marine species present in our empire. In Fiji, we have quite a lot of uh, what we call locally managed marine areas. Um, they have worked in terms of what the community say 
when they, they have species that they're monitoring and in terms of overall catch fisheries. Uh, but scientifically, whether they are working in the long term, we don't know because a lot of the major species, the big, big fish, for example, they have not really come back. One of the most important key species within a marine environment or marine ecosystem are sharks. Uh, there's been a lot of pressure by uh, uh, offshore longline vessels that actually catch shark as bycatches. Uh, these uh, species, they are uh, a king to the food chain within our marine environment and if we lose out on them they, it causes an imbalance within the whole ecosystem. You'll get more smaller uh, fish species than the bigger ones. There is a possibility that um, an ecosystem uh, that loses out on a certain species can collapse uh, which is why it's important to try and bring back the species that are important within our ecosystem. The last 20 years Okay, you never catch any bigger fish in your reef. As well as playing an important role in an ecosystem, sharks also have an economic value. The indigenous community in Benga have created a tambu area at Shark Reef and established a shark dive in order to achieve a sustainable future. Years ago we started Shark Reef and it's very hard for the people to accept. But it's a matter of going there and educate them, you know, sit down in the community hall, we talk about it. They thought they might lose it forever. No, 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 it's not going to be ours. It's still yours. So when they learn that you know, we really need to do this, and then, okay, Papa, we'll give you one year. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, we go down, we take like 150 kilograms of food. Okay, Papa is standing there with the food in, in front of me, and then they come one at a time one at a time. So I pick the food and feed them and go around. Okay, next. And every level of feeding, we, we feed different sharks. In 30 meter, we feed only bull sharks. In 15 meter, we feed bull sharks and tiger. All right. In 10 meter, we feed gray reef sharks and a white tip. In 4 meter, meter, we feed black and white. So they have, they have their own uh, uh, level of feeding yeah. and we do it very professional the way we, we feed this animal. We don't feed these sharks on the shallow because of the local people. We don't want them to come to the surface so uh, everybody's happy. And then after 10 years, just a couple of months ago, I went back to the village, interviewed some fishermen. So they told me the story that the last 20 years we don't we don't catch a big fish like that right here in our shore. Well, what about today? Today we do. Uh, even the corals are coming back. And then a couple of weeks ago we have a marine biologist from from Hawaii. They discover many new more fish. More new fish are coming back in that site, which is good. Which is good to the people and to the uh, operation. What we are doing, yes. My number one fear is the people who are killing the sharks. Uh, they are coming this way. We are worrying when, if these people arrive in Fiji and they'll kill all the sharks, right? you know, the shark finning, they are very expensive, very big market in Asia. Okay? If one fishing boat stops there in one night, we might lose 75 bull sharks there. I ask the government, please, put this law in, ban the killing of the sharks in Fiji, especially in Fiji. Stop the killing of the sharks. My sense is, is that in making a strategy, we want to be as flexible and as diverse as the earth itself is. And we need to be as creative as, as the situation that tests us. 
Uh, so we're going to have to fashion some solutions ourselves where none exists now. We will have to create it. Uh, but we have every capacity of doing this, for goodness sakes. We can send people to the moon. We can address the problems right here on Earth. One of the really encouraging things about the last 10 or 15 years has been the reestablishment of the customary management systems in the Pacific of the Tambu areas, of the no fishing areas. And in many cases, or in most cases, that's enough to bring back the biodiversity. Uh, the corals do better when there's fish, and the fish do better when there's corals. Corals are a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful thing. And not only are they important because of their beauty, they're important because they provide the very habitat structure that builds the reef. When you lose the coral, you lose 90% of the biodiversity or more. That biodiversity is the foundation of the food supply. If we take care of biodiversity, food security will take care of itself because the systems, the natural systems are productive. They are productive. They produce surplus resources that can be harvested by people. But sometimes the corals don't come back on the reef. The corals are the foundation of the fish habitat. So you don't get the corals back, you don't have the fish. And it's those places that the communities are getting involved in replanting the corals and doing coral gardening. These coral gardeners in Fiji are working with biologists and fishermen to bring back their fish. Searching in their established tambu area to find the best conditions for their coral to grow. They set about bending iron rods to create the frames for their coral nursery. Just like gardeners on land, these coral gardeners take cuttings from the corals. Searching to find those that are strong and have survived the bleaching. These precious clippings, being sure to keep them in salt water as much as possible, are attached to coral cookies, which have been sewn onto trays. These are the first trays in the coral nursery and will become the mother tables. This means these gardeners will never have to take from the wild again. We hear from the locals what they feel about the corals. They expect them to be very big and beautiful. They're trying to help us to restore back what we lost for a couple of years ago from those, the last century until the new millennium. So we are very excited about this. We, we, we hope that we are doing this for the next generation to come. We leave something for them behind. Wonderful. In six months, these corals start branching out. Within less than two years, small cuttings have multiplied into 50 or more cloned coral heads. Some of these cuttings go back onto new trays to create another harvest, and the others are planted back onto the reef. Communities that plant corals take care of their corals. That connection of knowledge that the planting of corals does is, is a whole new, it opens up whole new vistas as far as support from the community, understanding and knowledge from the community, and then they have the patience to wait for the decade it might take for the corals to start coming back on their own. Coral gardening, um, reef restoration project, it gives you hope 
that even if a reef is damaged, there is hope that you can still restore it back to what it was. Within no time, the coral takes hold of the reef. Planting this coral inspires the communities to take care of their reefs and to realize what a fragile environment they are living in. In a couple of years, this will be full of fish. They have helped bring back to life an area of their reef. Even though the people of the Pacific are finding solutions to global problems, other island nations are at risk of losing their entire biodiversity. Tuvalu is one of the world's smallest nations made up of nine small atolls, home to 12,000 people and only four meters above sea level. Tuvalu is slowly being lost to the ocean. You are listening to Radio Tuvalu. I'm telling you your presenter for the next three hours. Tuvalu is not sinking, but still remains the same through the protection of our Heavenly Father. We are experiencing uh, frequent visits from uh, storms and hurricanes. We, we are literally living on seawater, where during high tides, houses are flooded with seawater, where the, the water just comes into the houses. What I feel due to sea level rise is that I am afraid. I feel sorry for my children and grandchildren. I'm really sad and frightened. From my childhood until now, I can see a tremendous change that has taken place due to climate change. When it is the normal high tide, sea water will be up to where we are. If we ignore Tuvalu and let Tuvalu go down today, tomorrow Kiribati will go down. And the next year, New York will go down. And then it goes on, it goes on. Before 92, there was an island here. And this, this island is not this small. A lot of coconut trees and pandemic trees. Our forefathers used the traditional way of planting where they, they dig right down to the underground water table and then plant. Now that method can no longer cater for the survival because of uh, sea level rise. I encourage my children to work on Kulaka because it is something very useful for us. It is also something that means a lot to us, because it is very much a part of us. This crop was here when these islands were formed. It's been used by our forefathers, and we are still using it today. It's something that we eat every day. If the sea level keeps rising, it will kill all these crops. We really don't know what will happen in the future. Well, as for the marine uh, situation in Tuvalu, you know, uh, because of climate change and the change, the increase in the temperature of the, um, the sea, uh, coral bleaching has become very uh, significant. And as a result of that, uh, we are losing our fish stocks and they are moving further and further out into the sea. We have been building this small uh, wall. It's a kind of uh, a sea wall to protect our shoreline. This, this shoreline used to be right further down, but uh, it has been eaten away by the sea. Especially during high tides, the tide will come right up. And this wall has taken me about two months to build this small portion of the wall. The width of the land is quite big, therefore I think I need about five walls like this to cover the whole 
length of the area. Therefore, even though it is expensive and it needs a lot of time and resources, we have to do it. We have to do it. Well, a year ago, when you first came, I was building this wall uh, from the other end. But here we are sitting on the, um, the other end of the wall, which we have managed to put together with the intention of uh, protecting our shores from the, um, the attack of the, the seas and uh, to, to avoid coastal erosion, avoid the sea from eating away the land. Yeah, I think we still need to fight. Even though Copenhagen was a disappointment, but we are heading towards Mexico and we need to, uh, to strengthen our stand and to try and convince to stand together with other Pacific Island countries and uh, small island states in our fight for survival. I think that's what we should do now. I don't believe in the concept of resettlement, taking us and settle us somewhere else. Because our identity as Tuvaluans is tied down to the land. And without that land, we are nothing. We are not Tuvaluans anymore. We, we lose everything that dictates what we are. Traditionally, when I feel um, suppressed, or I feel worried, or I feel like I, I'm out of touch, I will just go to my grandfather or my father's grave, sit there and, and talk to them. <laughs> We have a very strong link with our dead. They, we don't look at them as people who have passed away. If we are to be displaced from this country, this is one very important aspect of our culture which we are going to lose. Because we cannot take our dead along with us. We will be going and they will be left here. And sure enough, uh, that link which nourishes our um, our knowledge that we are always being protected by our ancestors will disappear. Let us remain in our country. Only we need help to ensure life continuity in our peaceful country. The option of moving to another country threatens me in relation to securing a future for my children. Therefore, it saddens me very much to think that my children would not be able to come back to a place they belong if it comes to relocation. Very bright people. People who are well aware of what is going on and, you know, and they always say it's easier financially to uplift 10,000 people and put them somewhere safe than trying to save the country. And I usually tell them that, you know, it's not that easy. And for me personally, I don't want to value to go down for nothing. If we have to face up to the risks of um, relocation and displacement, it has to be for something. We, we will be forced to a, to a foreign land where we won't have any sovereignty, we won't have any rights there. We won't have that, be able to continue that connection to the land that we, we, we were born and raised on. So yes, some governments are saying, come on over, we'll accept you. But that's not what the people want. You'll, you'll hear elders say, I'm going to stay here even if I die here when the sea level rises. Yeah.
As we know, we will really be affected by this rising sea level. It is sad because to move to another place, we will be leaving behind the place where we grew up in and know so well. But if we relocate, it is very sad because that place is not ours. We don't know that place. We know that displaced populations, those who were previously displaced by war, now being displaced uh, by conservation efforts, uh, these populations continue to live in a very secluded ways. They many times are not able to regain their cultural cohesion. Uh, and you have destabilization in governments because it's simply cannot assimilate and there is no way for them to be part of the larger dominant society and because of this there is societal strife and there's separation and there's segregation in the cities and rural areas where these uh, peoples now live so there is disruption that comes to the larger states uh, of the UN as the smaller ones are squeezed out of existence and I don't think that there is, I don't think that there is a way to resolve it by putting families and individuals through processes of socialization, very costly. You can teach someone a new language, but you cannot make them forget that they're island peoples. You cannot force them to surrender their culture. It will always be a loss and it will always be a wound. And that is the wound that will fester into racial and social disunity in the larger countries. Whether or not the governments of the world make these decisions that may or may not be in our favor, we will continue to live as a people. We will stand for what is right and we will we'll live on and we're not going anywhere. The final plank in the Convention on Biodiversity is the equitable sharing of access to that biodiversity, which originally was designed for bioprospectors and people who wanted to find new cures for cancer and AIDS and things in tropical forests or lagoons. But now it is interpreted much more widely to mean that, yeah, let's look at that living biodiversity as a bank account, that we can live off the growing interest, but that we must also ensure that there are equitable access to it so so only a few people don't have access to it it is a bank but it can only be a bank for us if we know what's there and what it can be used for therefore the knowledge of what it can be used for is extremely important we have to record it because as i said our tradition is oral and when these people who know about it die we've lost it for the majority of rural people they don't have bank accounts. And their real bank account is all of those trees and medicinal plants and agricultural crops and fish and shellfish and uh, crustaceans, crabs, lobsters, and all these things. And so the whole idea is if you have a small marine protected area which acts as a nursery or you protect some areas of forest, you're going to have a reserve that will continue to grow. And you hopefully, if you manage it correctly, you'll live off of the the, that interest rather than eating your capital. Here in the Pacific, I think we hold one of the last resources that needs to be protected, that needs to be managed, uh, not only for our generation but also future generations. If indigenous peoples are respected and if our rights are respected, then I think indigenous peoples are willing to, to work with, with researchers and to build these relationships with governments because we know that we will be there every step of the way. Creating something that is culturally based, but deals with the modern globalization problems 
in a way that we can say to our children that we are handing you something better than we found it, I think is, is the essence of the responsibility that we have. What we need to do is recognize that just as the earth and the creatures of the earth survive in their great diversity, so also the culture of humankind survives in its great diversity. Uh, if we are to learn the ways of the desert, it is best to go to the cultures that were created to care for the desert. And if we are going to take the precious resources of the ocean and maintain them for future generations, then it is best to go to the ones who are the keepers of that sacred and holy knowledge. Government doesn't have the resources. Government would be happy for groups to come in and take some of their responsibility off their hands. And that's the future. Government can't do it. People have to do it. Government can support people in getting the reforms done, in getting the restoration done. But it's the people that are doing it. And it's the people who will do it as they gain the sense of, of responsibility. I want to advise all the indigenous people in the world today. We must hold hand together. If we want to save our ocean, if we want to save our turtle, our fish, our sharks, we have to hold hand. So all the people who are listening from any part of the world, especially the bigger country, please, uh, you have to look after small island nation like us. My sense is, is that in making a strategy, we want to be as flexible and as diverse as the earth itself is. And we need to be as created as, as the situation that tests us. Uh, so we're going to have to fashion some solutions ourselves where none exists now. We will have to create it. Uh, but we have every capacity of doing this, for goodness sakes. We can send people to the moon we can address the problems right here on Earth. One of the really encouraging things about the last 10 or 15 years has been the reestablishment of the customary management systems in the Pacific of the Tambu areas, of the no fishing areas. And in many cases, or in most cases, that's enough to bring back the biodiversity. Uh, the corals do better when there's fish, and the fish do better when there's corals. Corals are a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful thing. And not only are they important because of their beauty, they're important because they provide the very habitat structure that builds the reef. When you lose the coral, you lose 90% of the biodiversity or more. That biodiversity is the foundation of the food supply. If we take care of biodiversity, food security will take care of itself because the systems, the natural systems are productive. They are productive. They produce surplus resources that can be harvested by people. But sometimes the corals don't come back on the reef. The corals are the foundation of the fish habitat. So you don't get the corals back, you don't have the fish. And it's those places that the communities are getting involved in replanting the corals and doing coral gardening. These coral gardeners in Fiji are working with biologists and fishermen to bring back their fish. Searching in their established tambu area to find the best conditions for their coral to grow. 
they set about bending iron rods to create the frames for their coral nursery. Just like gardeners on land, these coral gardeners take cuttings from the corals, searching to find those that are strong and have survived the bleaching. These precious clippings, being sure to keep them in salt water as much as possible, are attached to coral cookies, which have been sewn onto trays. These are the first trays in the coral nursery and will become the mother tables. This means these gardeners will never have to take from the wild again. We hear from the locals what they feel about the corals. They're a tiny subject. They expect them to be very big and beautiful. They trying to help us to restore back what we lost for a couple of years ago from those the last century until the new millennium. So we are very excited about this. We, we, we hope that we are doing this for the next generation to come. We leave something for them behind. Wonderful. In six months, these corals start branching out. Within less than two years, small cuttings have multiplied into 50 or more cloned coral heads. Some of these cuttings go back onto new trays to create another harvest, and the others are planted back onto the reef. Communities that plant corals take care of their corals. That connection of knowledge that the planting of corals does is, is a whole new, it opens up whole new vistas as far as support from the community, understanding and knowledge from the community, and then they have the patience to wait for the decade it might take for the corals to start coming back on their own. Coral gardening um, reef restoration project, it gives you hope that even if a reef is damaged, there's hope that you can still restore it back to what it was. Within no time, the coral takes hold of the reef. Planting this coral inspires the communities to take care of their reefs and to realize what a fragile environment they are living in. In a couple of years, this will be full of fish. They have helped bring back to life an area of their reef. Even though the people of the Pacific are finding solutions to global problems, other island nations are at risk of losing their entire biodiversity. Tuvalu is one of the world's smallest nations, made up of nine small atolls, home to 12,000 people, and only four meters above sea level. Tuvalu is slowly being lost to the ocean. You are listening to Radio Tuvalu. I'm telling you, your presenter for the next three hours. Tuvalu is not sinking, but still remains the same through the protection of our Heavenly Father. We are experiencing uh, frequent visits from uh, storms and hurricanes. We, we are literally living on seawater where during high tides houses are flooded with seawater where the, the water just comes into the houses. What I feel due to sea level rise is that I am afraid. I feel sorry for my children and grandchildren. I am really sad and frightened. From my childhood until now, I can see a tremendous change that has taken place due to climate change. When it is the normal high tide, 
sea water will be up to where we are. If we ignore Tuvalu and let Tuvalu go down today, tomorrow Kiribati will go down. And the next year, New York will go down. And then it goes on, it goes on. Before 92, there was an island here. And this, this island is not this small. A lot of coconut trees and pandemic trees. Our forefathers used the traditional way of planting where they, they dig right down to the underground water table and then plant. Now that method can no longer cater for the survival because of uh, sea level rise. I encourage my children to work on Kulak because it is something very useful for us. It is also something that means a lot to us because it is very much a part of us. This crop was here when these islands were formed. It's been used by our forefathers and we are still using it today. It's something that we eat every day. If the sea level keeps rising, it will kill all these crops. We really don't know what will happen in the future. Well, as for the marine uh, situation in Tuvalu, you know, uh, because of climate change and the change, the increase in the temperature of the, um, the sea, uh, coral bleaching has become very uh, significant. And as a result of that, uh, we are losing our fish stocks and they are moving further and further out into the sea. We have been building this small uh, wall. It's kind of uh, a sea wall to protect our shoreline. This, this shoreline used to be right further down, but uh, it has been eaten away by the sea. Especially during high tides, the tide will come right up. And this wall has taken me about two months to build this small portion of the wall. The width of the land is quite big, therefore I think I need about five walls like this to cover the whole length of the area. Therefore, even though it is expensive and it needs a lot of time and resources, we have to do it. We have to do it. A year ago, when you first came, I was building this wall uh, from the other end. But here we are sitting on the, um, the other end of the wall, which we have managed to put together with the intention of uh, protecting our source from the, um, the attack of the, the seas and uh, to, to avoid coastal erosion, avoid the sea from eating away the land. Yeah, I think we still need to fight. Even though Copenhagen was a disappointment, but we are heading towards Mexico and we need to, uh, to strengthen our stand and to try and convince to stand together with other Pacific Island countries and uh, small island states in our fight for survival. I think that's what we should do now. I don't believe in the concept of resettlement, taking us and settle us somewhere else. Because our identity as Tuvaluans is tied down to the land. And without that land, we are nothing. We are not Tuvaluans anymore. We, we lose everything that dictates what we are. Traditionally, when I feel um, 
suppressed or I feel worried or I feel like I, I'm out of touch. I will just go to my grandfather or my father's grave, sit there and, and talk to them. We have a very strong link with our dead. They, we don't look at them as people who have passed away. If we are to be displaced from this country, this is one very important aspect of our culture which we are going to lose. Because we cannot take our dead along with us. We will be going and they will be left here. And sure enough, uh, that link which nourishes our, our knowledge that we are always being protected by our ancestors, will disappear. Let us remain in our country. Only we need help to ensure life continuity in our peaceful country. The option of moving to another country threatens me in relation to securing a future for my children. Therefore, it saddens me very much to think that my children would not be able to come back to a place they belong if it comes to relocation. Very bright people. People who are well aware of what is going on and, you know, and they always say it's easier financially to uplift 10,000 people and put them somewhere safe than trying to save the country. And I usually tell them that, you know, it's not that easy. And for me personally, I don't want Tuvalu to go down for nothing. If we have to face up to the risks of um, relocation and displacement, it has to be for something. We, we will be forced to a, to a foreign land where we won't have any sovereignty, we won't have any rights there. We won't have that, be able to continue that connection to the land that we, we, we were born and raised on. So yes, some governments are saying, come on over, we'll accept you. But that's not what the people want. You'll, you'll hear elders say, I'm going to stay here even if I die here when the sea level rises. As we know, we will really be affected by this rising sea level. It is sad because to move to another place, we will be living behind the place where we grew up in and know so well. But if we relocate, it is very sad because that place is not ours. We don't know that place. We know that displaced populations, those who were previously displaced by war, now being displaced uh, by conservation efforts, uh, these populations continue to live in a very secluded ways. They many times are not able to regain their cultural cohesion. Uh, and you have destabilization in governments because it's simply cannot assimilate and there is no way for them to be part of the larger dominant society and because of this there is societal strife and there's separation and there's segregation in the cities and rural areas where these uh, peoples now live so there is disruption that comes to the larger states uh, of the UN as the smaller ones are squeezed out of existence and I don't think that there is, I don't think that there is a way to resolve it by putting families and individuals through processes of socialization, very costly. You can teach someone a new language, but you cannot make them forget that they're island peoples. You cannot force them to surrender their culture. It will always be a loss and it will always be a wound. And that is the wound that will fester into racial and social disunity in the larger countries. Whether or not the governments of the world make these decisions that may or may not be in our favor, 
we will continue to live as a people. We will stand for what is right and we will, we will live on and we're not going anywhere. The final plank in the Convention on Biodiversity is the equitable sharing of access to that biodiversity, which originally was designed for bioprospectors and people who wanted to find new cures for cancer and AIDS and things in tropical forests or lagoons. But now it is interpreted much more widely to mean that, yeah, let's look at that living biodiversity as a bank account, that we can live off the growing interest, but that we must also ensure that there are equitable access to it. So, so only a few people don't have access to it. It is a bank, but it can only be a bank for us if we know what's there and what it can be used for. Therefore, the knowledge of what it can be used for is extremely important. We have to record it because, as I said, our tradition is oral, and when these people who know about it die, we've lost it. For the majority of rural people, they don't have bank accounts. And their real bank account is all of those trees and medicinal plants and agricultural crops and fish and shellfish and uh, crustaceans, crabs, lobsters, and all these things. And so the whole idea is if you have a small marine protected area which acts as a nursery or you protect some areas of forest, you're going to have a reserve that will continue to grow. And you hopefully, if you manage it correctly, you'll live off of the the, that interest rather than eating your capital. Here in the Pacific, I think we hold one of the last resources that needs to be protected, that needs to be managed, uh, not only for our generation, but also future generations. If indigenous peoples are respected, and if our rights are respected, then I think indigenous peoples are willing to, to work with, with researchers and to build these relationships with governments, because we know that we will be there every step of the way. Creating something that is culturally based, but deals with the modern globalization problems in a way that we can say to our children that we are handing you something better than we found it, I think is, is the essence of the responsibility that we have. What we need to do is recognize that just as the earth and the creatures of the earth survive in their great diversity, so also the culture of humankind survives in its great diversity. Uh, if we are to learn the ways of the desert, it is best to go to the cultures that were created to care for the desert. And if we are going to take the precious resources of the ocean and maintain them for future generations, then it is best to go to the ones who are the keepers of that sacred and holy knowledge. Government doesn't have the resources. Government would be happy for groups to come in and take some of their responsibility off their hands. And that's the future. Government can't do it. People have to do it. Government can support people in getting the reforms done, in getting the restoration done. But it's the people that are doing it. And it's the people who will do it as they gain the sense of, of responsibility. I want to advise all the indigenous people in the world today we must hold hand together. If we want to save our ocean, if we want to save our turtle, our fish, our sharks, we have to hold hand. So all the people who are listening from any part of the world, especially the bigger country, please, uh, you have to look after small island nation like us.